then for our last talk of the day, we have Professor Ivan Losev from uh, Yale University who will talk to us about Springer, Pachesi, and Threatening. Thank you. Uh, and this is joint uh, work with our host, Pavla. So uh, I would like to thank the organizers for having me. Uh, it's been a very special year in several respects. So uh, <clears throat> you see the title and you see a plan. So the, let me explain what uh, all this is about. So, you know, uh, when we do representation theory, we like uh, constructible coherent correspondences. In fact, in the special year seminar this semester, we talked about one instance of um, such correspondence. And um, uh, the goal of this talk is to establish um, another instance of uh, constructible coherent correspondence, which I think is fun and useful. And uh, what we'll be doing, uh, we'll prove an isomorphism between two objects. So the first object, uh, which will be called Springer, is uh, equivalent barrel moore homology of a suitable affine Springer fiber. That's a constructible guy. And uh, Precesi uh, will refer to global sections of a certain uh, vector bundle. That's a coherent guy. Okay, so the plan of the talk is to first disguise the constructible side, that's the Springer part, then talk about coherent side, uh, the Precesi part. Uh, the main part of the talk is to explain how these two parts are related to each other, that's number three. And then um, an isomorphism is actually established using uh, Chirinik algebras. So Chirinik, uh, as in many other contexts, refers to Chirinik algebras. Okay, so let me uh, let me proceed and talk about the constructible side. It's uh, uh, yes, yeah, there was a raised hand. Uh, I think you can unmute yourself. Yeah, there's a All right, maybe I should- Oh man, I think I might've hit the wrong button. My, my apologies. Okay. Happens. Um, okay, so uh, we start with the connected reductive group, which surprisingly is denoted by G. And then we have a three algebra, a little German G. We consider a maximal torus in G and it's the algebra which will be denoted by H. Then uh, we can take the uh, Langlands dual torus T check. Uh, we have the wild group, which acts on both to I. Uh, then uh, we'll consider lambda, which will be the core character lattice of T and so the character lattice of T check, okay? And I can form the affine wild group, which is a semi-direct product of uh, W and lambda. Next notation uh, K uh, is going to be as a field of Laurent series with complex coefficients. So that I can in particular consider uh, G over K. And inside of G over K, I'll consider the standard to the Horace subgroup. And I can form the quotient, which is a fine flag right, okay, GK mod I. Now, uh, I want to consider a Springer fiber inside of this uh, affine flag variety, and uh, I will need a very special choice. So I will pick an uh, element S in H, which will be regular. And I will pick a D, which is bigger equal than zero. And then I can consider the following element E uh, sub D, which is T sub D, T to power D times S. That's an element of my uh, uh, loop algebra, GK. And then uh, with this element, I can consider it Springer fiber. So with the all uh, evacuary conjugates whose Lie algebra contains my important element. Well, alternatively, you can write this formula which uh, I'm sure it's familiar for familiar to many people in the audience. All right, so that's uh, that's annotation. 
uh, the, star, the object that I'm uh, going to consider will be by modules over suitable algebra. So let me explain how this by module is defined on the Springer set. Uh, if I have a Springer fiber, I can consider its um, barrel homology. Okay. And if I have uh, some group which stabilizes the element, then this group will act on the fiber. I can consider equivalent variable homology. So my element E sub D is centralized by uh, loops into the torus. And so this loop group acts on the affine Springer fiber. And in particular, the uh, constant part, the maximal torus T X. So uh, the homology I'm going to consider is here. So it's equivalent Barrel-Moore homology of my Springer fiber. Okay. And it turns out that it has a lot of structure. Namely, it, uh, it is a graded bimodule over the following algebra. So which I will denote by H times. And what it is, is like this. So I uh, take the cotangent bundle of Kichak. It's nothing complicated, it's just, uh, you know, it's uh, regular functions on Kichak times H. H is a cotangent direction. And then on this algebra, I have an H selection of the wild group. So I can form the smash product. So if you're not familiar with the smash product, uh, it's formed in such a way that modules over uh, this panel are W equivalent modules over the initial algebra. Okay, so I get an associative algebra. This is my H times, and uh, it should act on uh, equivalent barrel moore homology from the left and from the right, and the actions should come in. So let me uh, explain how these actions are constructed. So let's start with the left action, which can be called. Uh, Spring the churn action. So inside of my H times, I have this subalgebra where I only use uh, Kichak. And the subalgebra is nothing else as a group algebra of the fine one. Now it's known uh, after Lustig and others that uh, in the fine setting, we still have spring sphere. So this uh, affine wild group acts on. Uh, equivalent barrel Moore homology of the spring of uh, That's uh, one part of the left action. And then I need to define action of H star, uh, which sit inside, sits inside of this algebra. So, you know, if you have a character of a torus T, then you can form a homogeneous vector bundle or a homogeneous line bundle on the fine flacorite. Okay. And I can uh, then take its uh, first charm class, gives the second usual cohomology, and the usual cohomology acts on barrel Moore homology. So uh, combining this together, I get an action of H star, and that's action by charm classes. Okay. And they glue together to an action of H times. So that's uh, one side. The other side is like this. So uh, lambda can be thought of as a component group of TK, okay? And TK acts on the spring the fiber, as we pointed out. So this will give rise to the action of the component group on the homology. So that's how the action of lambda arises. Uh, the action of W arises in a sort of similar way. So W doesn't preserve the Springer fiber. However, it will map the Springer fiber to a very similar Springer fiber. You just choose a different regular semi-simple element. And one can show, that's the only way how I know this is done is via equivalent localization theorem, that uh, for different choices of S, the resulting Springer fibers uh, have barrel moore homology, which is a canonically identical. And so uh, using this, I get uh, action of W, the finite variable. 
And the easiest part of this is action of H times. So I consider equivalent cohomology. So H times is going to act by equivalent properties. OK? And again, uh, these reactions combine to an action of H times. Uh, questions? What's the difference between the left action and the right action of H star? For some reason, I was I was thinking the left action was also covariant parameters. Ah, uh, it's not. It's not. I mean, it's not a trivial. It's not a trivial line bundle, right? So Trivial. here you can say that you act by a chain classes of trivial equivalent line bundles, and here this ah. guys are non-trivial. So think about equivalent cohomology of the usual flag parameter. Ah, uh, I see. Okay. All right. So uh, we have a bimodule. We uh, should try to start its properties. And the first one is really easy. It's kind of the only example that I really understand. So when d is equal to 0, uh, the springer fiber is just torus fixed locus. And the torus fixed locus is identified with a fine wild group. It's discrete. So uh, thanks to this, I just have an identification of my equivalent baron with, um, uh, with this. Just, you know, a bunch of points. And uh, this tensor product is naturally identified with H times. Now, uh, uh, there are the following two properties which are going to be very important. We will see them a number of times. So the property one times is that uh, the isomorphism that I have above is actually of graded bimodules, which shouldn't be very much surprising. Perhaps a more surprising property is that the bimodules I consider for D and D plus one are related to each other. Namely, what I can do, I can pick a trivial and sign at importance in uh, the group algebra of the wild group. And then I can hit uh, the bimodule for, for D plus one by E minus on the left, I take the sign invariant part. And I can hit the bimodules for D by uh, epsilon on, on the left as well, meaning that I take invariants. And these two things are still right modules of H times. But on the left, you have an, you only retain an action of the so called spherical subalgebra in H times, and this is this algebra of invariants. It turns out that here uh, I have an isomorphism of graded by okay. over this uh, two algebras. So this was the Springer part. Now let me proceed to the precessor part. Why do you have that isomorphism? Um, you have a better, well, I mean, there may be an easy, an easy way to see this isomorphism. You have a better one which is established using localization to fix points. I, yes, it, this can be uh, done through localization, but a geometric way of seeing it is the um, um, sign in, invariance and the trivial um, um, invariance correspond to uh, uh, Springer fibers in the Grassmannian. One is the Spaltenstein variety, and one is the Steinberg. And in the because right because the unipotent radical of geo is just TGO. Well, the Lie algebra is just TGO. That's where the relation between D and D plus one comes from. Thank you about that. Yeah. Okay, so let's get to Prachet. And uh, the most classical case here is when my group is GLA. So let me consider this first. So the one group is a symmetric group. H is just a coordinate vector space. W acts on the cotangent bundle of H times. Of, of H star, and this is just a C to 2 M matrix. And what I can do, I can consider uh, the following singular variety. That's something that has to do with the algebra that we've seen in the previous slide. So that's in our case, so we just get the symmetric power of C2. And then I have uh, algebra H without any times, which will be the smash product of the polynomials on this vector space with double. Okay. And another player that I will need is a resolution of singularities for Y. Uh, I will call it my X, and that's a famous guy that's a Hilbert scheme of N points on C2. Okay. 
what I mentioned, n ideals in uh, polynomials in two variables. Now, on this x, I have uh, a very remarkable vector bundle called Prachesi bundle, whose existence was uh, conjectured by Prachesi and which was first constructed by Mark Hyman. Uh, that's a vector bundle on x with the following important property. So derived endomorphisms of this vector bundle are identified with the algebra H, meaning that endomorphisms are H and there are no higher x's, okay? And because of this isomorphism, uh, the group SN will act by automorphisms of my vector bundle, and each fiber is a regular representation. So the total rank is n factorial. Now I can take various isotypic components, for example, for the trivial and for the sign. And because of this uh, isomorphism, what I get is going to be line bundles. For the sign, for the trivial, I will have the structure shift. And for the sign, I will have the guy which I will call O of one, and that's an ample generator of Bikram in this case. And then uh, I want to consider the following bimorphism. I take endomorphism of P as a shift, and then I multiply by O of D and take global sections. That's naturally a, a bimorphism because of uh, this is a multiple here. And uh, one a useful fact is that uh, there are no higher cohomology for this bundle, uh, which you can see, well, the only way how I know uh, how one can see this is uh, to use an alternative construction of P due to Bezrukovnikov and Kaledin using quantizations in characteristic P. Okay. And then uh, my entire picture is graded. Um, well, actually it's by graded, but I will mostly need only one grading, which comes from the action on H, okay? From the scaling on H. So uh, I have this uh, graded by module and I again want to understand its uh, properties. Uh, which I will do. Uh, a bit later after I explain the general case. In fact, this construction generalizes to an arbitrary reduction. So let me explain how this works. Uh, I can still form the variety Y, uh, the singular fine variety. It's a Poisson variety. And we can look at partial Poisson resolutions in this variety. There is a particular resolution that I will need, and I'm not going to explain. Well, I mean, if you are an expert, you will see hints uh, which one I, I have to choose. But there is a partial uh, Poisson resolution, X of Y, uh, which in particular has the following nice property. The singular locus has a dimension big or equal than four. So in the previous example, uh, I can just take X to be the Hilbert scheme. It's actually smooth. And one can uh, generalize the Prachesi bundle to the setting. What you get will not be a vector bundle because X is singular. It's going to be a maximal coin Macaulay shape on X. And in particular, if I restrict to the smooth locus, uh, this will become a vector bundle. Uh, and then uh, it has properties which generalizes uh, familiar properties of the usual pressure of uh, Then the morphism shape is again for Macaulay. Uh, the derived endomorphisms as an algebra is H. The invariant part is a structure shape. Now, the sign invariant is not going to be a vector bundle, so we cannot really taught, say that it's sample. Uh, it's a maximal coin Macaulay module. Its restriction to the regular locus is a line bundle, as before. And the ampleness properties that it has is like this. So for suitable positive integer L, the L's um, power of this vector bundle is the restriction of something ample from X. Okay. Okay. 
So uh, now let me get to definition of a bimodule. I consider iota, which is the inclusion of x rec to x. And then it turns out uh, that for any negative integer, the push forward of this vector bundle on the regular locus to the entire thing is coin Macaulay and uh, high cohomology vanishes, which you also see using characteristic beta. So then I can form uh, the generalization of B sub D that I had before, like so. Um, that's still a great age by module. And that's what I want to start. Maybe I should say, well, uh, are there any questions? So let me try to briefly explain why I would care about uh, this bind. So this motivation mostly comes from the GLM case where this bimodule is supposed to be related to a bunch of stuff, uh, classical combinatorics of symmetric functions, havana um, Frazanski homology of torus nodes and links, uh, maybe a bit more mysterious relation is to things like character shifts. Um, uh, so it kind of appears in lots of places. Okay. And uh, so I want to understand this by module a bit better. Now let's talk about the properties in the general case. So here's again my uh, B sub D. And uh, I have properties which are very similar to what I had for my previous by module. Okay. Uh, literally from the definition, we see that B0 is H as a greatest by module. It's essentially the defining property of the project. But then uh, you work a little bit on the definition and you see this isomorphism, which is uh, again, very similar to what we had in the Springer part of this talk. Yeah, okay. It has to do with uh, the sign invariance in the Prachesi being all flat, okay? So that's kind of, that's more or less a tautology. So epsilon minus times B uh, D plus one is a natural isomorphic to epsilon uh, B times D. Okay. So uh, you see that the two bimodules that I presented uh, have very similar properties. So you can ask whether they are the same in any reasonable way. And uh, of course, one obstruction to here is that they are bimodules of a different algebras. But these algebras have something in common, which is what I'm going to explain next. So we uh, pass to uh, the interaction between the Prachesi site and the Springer site. And uh, what these all things have in common is their completions. So what you can do, uh, you can take the algebra of regular functions on the torus to check. So this is this algebra of Laurent polynomials. And you consider uh, the completion at one. That's algebra of formal power series. On the other hand, uh, you can look at uh, C of H dual and complete it at zero. You got two algebras of formal power series, which are naturally isomorphic. The isomorphism is given just by the exponential map. Okay. And then I can, well, uh, the C of H uh, dual is not exactly central in H, but it's very close to be central. So I can still complete H at uh, zero uh, in this way, okay? This is still, still has the natural structure of an algebra. And similarly, I can uh, do it for the algebra coming from the torus here. And uh, these two algebras are isomorphic via the same exponential, okay? So this algebra will be denoted by H uh, H. So here, which stands for completion, and when it, it grows, it uh, becomes lambda. Okay, so just so this is a little wedge, and lambda is usually big. So I have this algebra, and I have uh, two great bimodules of this algebra. I have a completion of B sub D, and I have a completion of uh, the equivalent BM homology of the Springer pipe. 
And these two guys share very similar properties, which will be called one wedge and two wedge. Okay. So at for zero, these are regular bivolumes. Okay. And then as a sign invariant part of uh, bimodule number D plus one is a trivial part, is the invariant part of bimodule number D for both families of bimodules. Okay. Uh, are there any questions? Good. Can you explain a little bit the construction of X? Like, what's the idea in outside of uh, AP? So, uh, partial Poisson resolutions are going to be parameterized by uh, cones in a set of hyperplane organizations. So, the largest cones correspond to maximal partial resolutions, which are key factorial terminalizations, but then I will also get, get some intermediate guys which correspond to phases and higher. Phases. Well, here we essentially only need to consider phases. And then uh, uh, this uh, O reg one, the sign component of Prachet is going to give you an element in the second cohomology in the space where this hyperplane arrangement lives. And you pick a phase where this element lies. In times B and C, uh, well, B flash C, you can explicitly construct this as a free overhead. Otherwise, it is just, you know, this. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thanks. Okay. So you look at these two properties and you ask what is the easiest possible reason for that? And of course, uh, here is uh, the easiest possible reason, which may be true or false, but uh, we would expect that the two families of bimodules are actually the same. Okay, and that's the first, uh, and actually, the, well, well, the first main theorem in our paper this part. So, for all the negative integers d, uh, we have a graded by module isomorphism from the completed Prachesi by module to the completed Springer by module. Okay. In fact, as a side remark, in type A, uh, we expect that one can do uh, better than that, but it's maybe the story for another time and for another team of courses. Uh, so this uh, theorem, you know, is interesting in its own right. I hope uh, we have uh, two objects of completely different origins, but it's also useful because uh, we can look at properties uh, on one side and try to establish properties on the other side. Okay. And here is the most, uh, you know, the first property that comes in mind um, by Goreski, Kotis and McPherson. This uh, equivalent uh, BM homology is flat over uh, um, equivalent parameters. Okay? And because uh, the spring of fiber has a fine tail. And uh, using this and also using a bi grading, which uh, we have, one can see that B sub D is free over equivalent parameters, which is completely not obvious from the definition. So well, that's the first corollary of the theorem. And the other corollaries have to do with just a part of uh, this bimodules. Namely, I have an uh, action of the uh, partial, well, over, over, over this algebra. Well, actually, I need to take like formal power series and half variables, but never mind. And I want to kill the section. I want to consider the fibers at zero. So formally, I turn the BD with the module which I call C0, that's just C with trivial action of H and the dual. And similarly, I can turn them uh, the Springer by module with C1. Okay. And I get isomorphic vector spaces which uh, retain all the structures they had before. In particular, what I have here is an isomorphism with respect to the right W action, and also with respect to the left W action. Uh, you can massage uh, the string apart a little bit. Um, namely, we kill the equivalent parameters, so we just deal with uh, usual non equivalent Baranov homology. And then I kill lambda, well, uh, which means that I take co invariants, okay, in this Baranov homology. 
this has a nice description. It's actually um, in, uh, dual of the invariance of lambda. So it's not a completion. Uh, in the cohomology of the spring profile. Okay, so that's uh, just an immediate corollary of the theorem. Uh, any questions? So I have a question actually. There's a, a grading on the Prochese side, which is, well, there's two gradings. Is it possible to say what the two gradings are on the Burrell Moore side? The uh, one, I guess, is homology. But... Right. So in our setting, we forget about so so this 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 guy kind of oops. Uh, it's sort of double graded. This left hand side. The right hand side is only one graded, and it's homological grade. Again, there is a better version of the theorem currently in the works by uh, Oscar and Pablo, where you have an isomorphism that you think about. So here you have. Uh, the thing without completions, and here you have the polynomial part of the spring defect. Is it a good answer? Oh, thanks. Yeah, actually, I was also wondering. So, what? Um, somehow, one side you have it's sort of infinite in two dimensions. If it's the full vial group, um, like in other words, the 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 grading on the first side, it's only positive. It only has positive terms, and like the the T degree or whichever one you want to refer to. But some on the right-hand side, it's like there's a the full vial group acting and the translation elements kind of have negative terms. Um, I'm it doesn't. trying to compare this if it's the same isomorphism that I've, <laughs> I've been looking it, it, It's not. Um, so, so I completed it one and that sort of kills other grid. Okay. So you, for, G, for GLN, there is still uh, an easy, stronger version of this where, you know, you use that H times as a localization of H. And there you have something, I think, by grade. And in one direction, of course, the gradient is both positive and negative. I see. For arbitrary wild groups, it doesn't make sense. So the only thing kind of, there's the only thing that uh, these two, two algebras, so these two bimodules have in common, is when we talk about completion at one. Oh, I of see. Course, so the completion. Of course, here you can also complete at other points and ask what you get. And maybe there are natural guesses to make, but uh, that's not something that we pursue. Uh, I see. So somehow the completion, it, it does something to the grading and it. Uh... That's right. When you come, it's, uh, it's kind of. And I don't know how you describe independently the remaining torus section, because here you still have the torus section. Even after completion. I see. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So let me uh, move to other applications. So we have this isomorphism here. In particular, we can take the invariant part on the right. Okay. We can hit with a dependent epsilon on the right. And we can compute the dimension of what we get, and actually other things too. Um, so the dimension of this right invariance is uh, d times h plus one, where h is a coxeter number, to dimension of h. And also we can recover the W module structure. And, you know, if, if you thought about the things, you, you understand what the structure should be. Okay. And uh, that's sort of a theorem which is best proof uh, using. Um, using the previous theorem, because uh, it's not so difficult to see that uh, the left-hand side has dimension big or equal than this. And here we use representations of rational Chirinic algebras. But on the other hand, uh, the right-hand side, uh, this thing, has dimension less or equal than what we need. And this is now using geometry of uh, affine spin fibers. From what I understand, uh, there should be independent proof of uh, this equality of uh, formula for this uh, due to Bizrukovnikov uh, by Shadel Varas, Shan, and Vesero using constructible geometry. Um, and actually, we borrow uh, part of the argument from them. Uh, it's an interesting question whether you can see this using coherent geometry. I don't know how to do this. But in any case, uh, I know that the two things are isomorphic, so their dimensions are the same. So that's one application. 
Uh, another application is prospective. It depends on the conjecture. And it has to do with uh, quantum groups at Ulsa Affinity. So uh, let me pick you, pick you to be an odd root affinity of, I guess, sufficiently large order. And uh, I need this because I want to consider the small quantum group for G check and the principal block. Okay. And uh, I think the order should be bigger than H or something like that. For this to exist. Now, inside of the principal block, I have the center, which is finally the mass commutative algebra. And in particular, G check is going to act on this algebra by automorphisms. Okay? So I want to understand the structure of this algebra. And uh, there is a conjecture uh, due to Bezrukovnikov by Shadow Alvarez, Shan, and Bessero, which says the following. So if I take lambda invariance, the invariance of the lattice in the uh, cohomology of the spring of fiber for E1, okay, uh, this should be isomorphic to uh, torus invariance in the center. And from what I understand, there is an injective map and subjectivity is currently in the box. So this is what you expect in general for GLN, there is much more that you can try to say. Uh, it turns out that uh, the famous N factorial theorem of Heyman implies that the right action of the wild group on the space is trivial. And not only it applies that, it's actually an equivalent formulation. Okay? So the action being trivial means if you believe um, this conjecture that torus invariance in Z coincide with the normalizing invariance. And for GLN, uh, well, I mean, this, um, I believe this shouldn't be the case for other groups. But for GLN in particular, this equality is particularly pleasant because we are talking about a GLN module with sufficiently small weights. And if for such a module this equality happens, then in fact the action of a uh, check on the module must be trivial. And therefore, well, um, it's an isomorphism with Z. And it's an isomorphism from a space whose dimension we know. Okay, that's a pre this theorem number two. In particular, what we get is that the dimension is n plus one to n minus one, and this is a conjecture of uh, Lyapovsky and Chi. Okay. Uh, questions? All righty. Last but not least, I need to talk about Chirignik. And uh, Chirignik is in the proofs of the main theorem. Um, so let me explain why uh, we would care about Chirinik algebras in uh, this setting. Of course, as many people know, Chirinik algebras are extremely useful and should be cared about, by, but, but why here? So let me remind you what we are after. So we want to prove theorem one, which is this isomorphism of bimodules over completions. Okay. So this too. And we sort of know partial information towards this result. Uh, we know that uh, the theorem holds at zero. And in fact, we get a regular bimodule. So that's nice. Uh, we know that uh, passing um, from D to D plus one uh, gives you the same relation for both families of bimodules. Yeah. Okay. And you ask, does this two properties formally imply the theorem? The answer is, alas, no. Uh, we could try to argue by induction. And if we do so, we arrive at something like that. But uh, this doesn't imply the theorem. Believe me or not. And what it has to do morally 
is this a basic statement from algebraic geometry? So suppose you have two vector bundles, let's say on smooth variety. And let's say you have an open sub variety with the restrictions are uh, isomorphic. Can we deduce that the two vector bundles are isomorphic? The answer is no in general, because it may so happen that the codimension of the boundary is one. Okay. And this is essentially why, why uh, this uh, isomorphism here doesn't imply this. Why is this relevant? Because, well, I mean, this is defined as uh, global sections of a vector bound. Good news is that, uh, as in many other contexts, things actually improve in deformation. It turns out that we can deform the two sides. And this will be now by modules of which you need unique algebras. Uh, they will have a property analogous to this. And now in that setting, we can actually deduce the full isomorphism from the partial isomorphism. Okay? So that's why Chiridnik uh, algebras appear in this story. So let me tell you a little bit about Chiridnik uh, algebras and uh, this binomial sketches. So let's start with the uh, rational Chiridnik algebra. Uh, I want to remind you what that is. So we start with a, well, we'll need a single complex parameter, C. And we define uh, an algebra over CH bar, over H bar is an indeterminate. So it's going to be the quotient of the smash product of the tensor algebra, like so, by W. And then I need to mod out the relations. Uh, well, of course, the uh, first relation says that uh, both brackets are equal to zero. So we fix that. Um, so elements of H commute among themselves and elements of H dual commute among themselves. Uh, now the second relation is a, a cross relation between elements of uh, H uh, dual, um, uh, H and H dual. I think I want to. Oh, well, no. So, what does it say? Um, so, the commutator is given by uh, this term. So, if I just have this term, I would have something like homogeneous uh, algebra differential operators. And then there is a funny correction term which uh, depends on the parameter C and which leaves in the group algebra. So that's a uh, rational Chiridnik algebra is defined by Tim and Bindberg. It's uh, bi-graded, but again, I will only consider one grading, where uh, degree of H and degree of W is zero, and degree of H dual and degree of H bar of one. This corresponds to the gradient that I had before. And what I get is a flat deformation of uh, this algebra H that I had previously. So that's... Um, Rational Chiridnik algebra. Now I want a bimodule. I want to deform my D to a bimodule over this algebra with suitable parameters. It turns out I can do so. And this is precisely where this result that I've mentioned in the Prachese section plays a role. Okay. Well, you imagine that abstractions to deformations lie in some homology. And thanks to these two conditions, these abstractions will just vanish. Okay. So there are no abstractions. Uh, I can deform uh, B sub D to a graded by module where on the left the parameter will be zero, on the right the parameter will be D. Okay. And it still has properties which now should be familiar. Uh, when D is equal to zero, uh, I get a regular bimodule. And then there is the same relation uh, when we go from D to D plus one. And now this are, well, I mean, this are algebras which may actually act on the two sides. And of course, you can say that uh, on the left hand side, there is a different algebra acting, but it's naturally isomorphic to the algebra on the right hand side. Okay. Are there questions?
All right. So this was deformation on the um, proceeds side. Let me explain the deformation on the spring side. So first of all, uh, here we'll have a trigonometric Chirinik algebra acting. I will denote it with superscript times, and it deforms uh, on H times. And just as before, um, these two algebras, the rational one and the trigonometric one, share a common completion. For rational, you complete at zero. For trigonometric, you complete at one. And uh, as for the my module, uh, we can deform uh, the equivalent barrel Moore homology just by extending equivalence. So remember, our element was homogeneous. It was uh, with respect to uh, the variable t. So another thing which will act on uh, the spring of fiber is the loop rotation. Okay. So uh, I can take this larger torus, which is my old T plus the loop rotation, and act on the spring of fiber and take the equivalent BM homology. And uh, thanks to GKM, uh, this deforms the usual equivalent, the equivalent homology with respect to a torus. And then we will have the following proposition, which is due to Pablo and myself, and also, also Oscar Kivinen, that uh, what we get is this deformation is actually a bimodule, as in the previous case, but uh, for trigonometric algebra. I have parameter zero on the left, parameter d on the right. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So now it still has familiar properties. For the same reason as before, well, at zero, we still have a like, discrete set. Uh, so the bimodule is a regular bimodule. And then I have um, um, an isomorphism uh, going from uh, invariance in D to sign invariance in D plus one. A priori, it's only isomorphism of right modules. At the end of the day, thanks to induction, it's also an isomorphism of bimodules. Okay. And now, uh, here is what we do briefly. So we want to now upgrade our theorem to this um, uh, deformation setting. And getting isomorphism uh, of bimodules over different algebras. And we uh, prove this by induction. Uh, the base we already know. Now, for the step, uh, we can assume that we have isomorphism of uh, sign invariant parts actually as bimodules. Okay. And a key observation is that. We can use the flatness. So this is not stuck here. We can use the flatness of uh, uh, this algebra to see that this isomorphism extends to isom isomorphism of the full module. And that's again this vector bundle thing that I've mentioned. So what, what we had before. So it was sort of like this. We had a vector bundle on the Precisi side, and we kind of had control over it, over the preimage of the regular locus in the singular variety of y. And this preimage has could I mention one. Okay. So control over that open locus didn't give us much. But now we deformed. We actually added another uh, direction. We increase, so to say, the dimension of our variety uh, by one. And uh, this bimodule on the Prachese side is still the global sections of a quantized vector bundle. But the locus which is bad only lives in the non deformed uh, variety. And the reason for this is that. If I invert H bar in my algebras, okay, then they are Marita equivalent.
Before this wasn't true. So the algebra H, which was a smash product, was not Morita equivalent to um, the algebra of invariance. But once you deform in this way, what you get is Morita equivalent. And so this shows that the bad locus suddenly has a dimension two, and we are now in control. And that's basically how this theorem is proved, uh, with which uh, let me finish. Any questions? So can I ask you, Ivan, the bimodule B, uh, once it's, when it's deformed, is something that you don't have an explicit construction of? It's only a, an existence as a deformation? Uh, well, I mean, when you invert H bar, uh, this is a classical thing in this translation bimodule. But then uh, you need to be careful about, well, I mean, you can do it like this. So this is data is equivalent to taking this translation bimodule and putting a filtration. And filtration is a bit subtle part. So I think uh, Gordon Stafford uh, handled the filtration in their paper, but the way how they did it depended on the results of Hayman. So which A are difficult, B are not available in other checks. Thanks. Um, for Coxeter groups, finite Coxeter groups that aren't wall groups, uh, the, the Springer side, I have no idea, but it seems like the coherent side should yeah. make sense. Do you have any? No, I mean, the coherent side just goes through. The constructible side, I don't know. I mean, you can speculate that maybe you can, you, you know, there is kind of this, there is a fine picture, which is clear. As a result of this finite picture, we, we, we need to somehow message your uh, character shifts well enough, and then they uh, give you a bimodule, and maybe that is massage. Uh, you, can, you can persuade yourself that uh, massage in uh, the coxeter type is not more difficult than massage in the wild group type. But I don't know, I mean, kind of um, indeed. Uh, so, I mean, the, uh, kind of one, one. Can, there, can you tell me what that, what the X, the X would be for dihedral groups, say? Oh, uh, you do the same thing as before. So, um, but we, what's the. I mean, uh, you have this whole bunch of uh, partial resolution, some partial resolutions that you understand. And then you have the direction which corresponds to the sort of one, also known as equal parameter direction in the Chiridini function. So you take this direction and you want x for which it is ample. For example, if, uh, if, you, are, if you have just one contiguous class of, of reflections and you take a, a key factorial terminalization itself, because uh, so the, the, the dimension of the space is a number of conjugacy kind of classes. And, um, but in general, you know, there's some guy. Sorry, and this theorem one, is it like an existence theorem or this isomorphism can be like uniquely determined by some property? Well, I mean, yes, and this, uh, this is the proof. This is inductive isomorphism. Mm -hmm. So you, you know I you see. start with a very explicit isomorphism at d equal zero, and then you get uh, an isomorphism of um, anti-spherical parts uh, for d equal one, and the claim is that you can lift it in any way. I see, and this isomorphism between anti-spherical parts it can be like explicitly written. Well, I mean it's inductive construction. Ah, okay, so okay. So if you Thank kind you. of you know. So the honest answer to the question is no, but uh, okay. Thank you. inductively you can understand.
Any other questions? So I have the specific question. So on this uh, coherent side, so can you think of this X as some kind of blow up and this could I mention to all that are singular? Um, so. so I think it's, uh, well, you definitely, uh, so, so as long as you know that uh, the dimension of a singular locus is bigger equals than two, this means that you resolved all the dimension two leaves. But if you talk to a birational geometer, I think they will tell you that uh, thinking of this as just blow up is a big oversimplification because you blow up, then you encounter some more singularities and so on and so forth. Right, but if I blow up, the singularities will be in co-dimension four kind of by construction. Uh, I'm not so sure. Because like the intersection of two of these things with co-dimension two will have co-dimension four, no? But then you kind of, you, 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 well, I mean, uh, if you just do, uh, I think if you just do it naively, this uh, doesn't work. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, you still need this, you know, uh, Barker, Cassini, Haken, McPherson stuff, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of, this is a grandchild. Um, But like given your theorem that you know the explicit description of this in commutative case, like can you say something about this? Okay. Well, I only know what X is uh, in times A, B, and C. Like really know. No, but like you know this by module explicitly uh, as a, like for all of D, like I think this theorem would give you Space of global sections of O of D uh, for all D as a module over. Like, well, this sounds maybe. Yeah, so maybe like in retrospect, like once you know the theorem, then maybe like you can say so. Well, you you may you 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 might be able to say that uh, your X is approach, but I mean, how much does it really tell you? I mean, that, that's what I'm asking, exactly. Well, uh, I think so, but to, to, to be sure, I need to think. And another stupid question. So on Springer side, so how do you quantize? Like one action is clear that you quantize by C star. Like, but the other action when you act by component group of the centralizer, like why it becomes non-commutative? Because, uh, you know, uh, the lattice is powers of T. Mm -hmm. right? And so kind of this commutativity comes from uh, the grading element interacting with the powers of T. Mm -hmm. And shifting the equivalent parameters. I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I had another question actually. Is there sort of a symmetrizer description of these modules for general O of K? Um, what a symmetrizer description? Well, I mean, something like, um, uh, you know, there, there's, in other words, a, sort of as a left and right module over the, um, the action of the vial groups on both sides. Is there sort of a, a symmetrizer description for the polygraph associated to uh, Prochese times Prochese times O of K um, for general K, like there is K equals uh, I don't know. one. I don't, yeah. I don't know polygraphs. <laughs> Maybe uh, one question that you, you would want to ask is, is whether we can handle any other interesting vector bundles. Oh, yes. Prochese times Prochese <laughs> And the answer is no. So our uh, success here has to do with a uh, very close relation between uh, the vector bundles that we consider and what you get from characteristic P. And mm -hmm. Prochese times Prochese U all time is not logical. I have no idea how it would come from the quantization story. That was my next question. So B, Prochese times Prochese and then powers of B is sort of not, uh... Uh, 
Any other questions? Okay, there are no more questions, but thank you, Monica.